You may have heard the rumor Louis Vuitton is set to revive one of their most successful collaborations. It is said that they may collaborate again with Japanese artist Sakashi Murakami. And I'm sure you all remember this one, the Monogram Multicolor, which was launched uh, under Marc Jacobs together with Takashi Murakami. It's probably one of their most iconic designs. It's not the only designs that Takashi Murakami created for the brand. I'm going to go into the details later, but when I heard the rumors, I was actually not that surprised that Louis Vuitton tries to build on this past success. So when we think about it, in the early 2000s, under Marc Jacobs, Louis Vuitton was it. It was hugely popular, it was very trendy, people were excited for the new drops, and now you may say, well, nothing has changed, Louis Vuitton is still very successful and popular, but also I am a fashion historian, so I want to go back to the past. This was not always the case. With brands, there are always ups and downs. And yes, most recently, Louis Vuitton was very successful, but there were also times where it was considered old-fashioned, boring. It was a heritage company, but nothing super fashionable or trendy. And I would say at the time, Marc Jacobs turned it around and he did this with the artist collaborations, which in the long run would become something hugely successful for the brand. And these artist collaborations did not start with Takashi Murakami. It was actually with the American fashion designer and artist Steven Sprouse. Marc Jacobs invited him to do kind of a redesign of the iconic logo, also the monogram canvas. And you may remember it was this graffiti on top of the monogram canvas. And at the time for the brand uh, themselves, it was actually quite innovative to do this because as I said before, Louis Vuitton was a heritage brand. They had their logo, they had the style and then slapping on graffiti was something that nobody really expected. And I read quite a few articles during the research for this video and many of them said that in Initially, it was actually meant to be kind of a one-off collaboration to do something new, but then it became hugely successful also to dare to even work with the logo, do something new with it and come up with this new design was just very successful. And it was not Steven Sprouse alone. It was this collaboration also with Marc Jacobs because I also found other articles that said uh, Marc Jacobs was actually inspired to do this after he saw, I think it was a monogram canvas trunk, which was covered in black. I don't remember the celebrity, but he saw it at one of the celebrities' houses. So he came up with this idea and then I guess together with uh, Steven Sprouse, they worked on this graffiti for the Louis Vuitton bags. Nobody anticipated the success of these artist collaborations. There have been many over time. The most recent one that you probably remember is the one with Japanese artist Yayoi Kusama. And I think at the time, Marc Jacobs knew he was onto something. And after Steven Sprouse, he invited the Japanese artist Takashi Murakami to work with the bags and the designs. And it was not a one-off thing. It actually ended up being a very long collaboration between the brand Louis Vuitton and Takashi Murakami. I will go into the details of all the designs a bit later. There's this interesting dynamic between fashion and art. You probably know that many of the brands uh, have their own art foundations, that they are huge patrons of the arts. And this link to the arts did not come out of nowhere. It was not that it came up during Marc Jacobs in the early 2000s. The brand already had a long history in the arts. Already Gaston Louis Vuitton, who was the grandson of of the founder commissioned artists for their boutiques and also in 2014 LVMH, the holding company of Louis Vuitton, opened the Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris, which is an art space and museum. So it did not come out of nowhere and also from a business perspective it made sense because it kind of opened up not only the product portfolio but also the audience for Louis Vuitton. Maybe with artist collaborations they could target an audience that they could not capture before. So from a business perspective, it was actually quite smart to diversify into this field with the link to the arts. And this monogram multicolor came out in 2003. It was the first of the Takashi Murakami designs for Louis Vuitton. And I think it was around Easter. It was definitely spring because I remember at the time I bought a blush pink trench coat which matched the bag. I just remember that uh, this launch was every were. Marketing wise, it was so well done. Everybody was talking about it. People were already waiting. This was before Instagram. This was before all the social media, the websites. So uh, it was a real offline hype, I would say. 
And actually at the time, I think it was my mom who told me about it and I really hoped that I would be able to get one of those. It was very, very special at the time to have access to such a bag. So initially I actually got a mini Speedy, which was very cute at the time. And this was also the trend in the early 2000s. We loved these micro bags, highly impractical, but we for some reason really loved them. So I was really excited about this mini Speedy, but after a few weeks, the edges turned yellow. And this was actually a production error of Louis Vuitton. It was the glue that turned uh, yellow. So I returned it to the store at the time and they actually said, uh, we're very sorry, this is a production mistake. And they gave me the pochette in exchange. I think in the long run, this may have been the better choice. The pochette is actually one of the models that is highly sought after on the resale market, but actually at the moment, I'm not really interested in selling it. And I also see that the mini Speedy in white is also very sought after. I think for the reason that there were these production problems and there are not that many, but I would just advise you if you want to buy it pre-loved and you are interested in this uh, white version, pay attention to these production mistakes because in the beginning I heard that they had quite a few issues. And what I would also like to say here, I was excited in the early 2000s about this bag, but this doesn't mean that this uh, video is sponsored by Louis Vuitton. This is a non-sponsored video I'm just sharing my personal opinion and my research here and I was not the only one who was excited and this was probably also part of this marketing mega strategy you saw Paris Hilton, Kim Kardashian, Jessica Simpson, all these it girls from the time carrying the Louis Vuitton monochrome multicolore in white and black. So of course this created a hype. And you may also now think of Mean Girls because Lindsay Lohan as Katie Heron was carrying a pochette also with the monochrome multicolore in white. But this was not the only Takashi Murakami slash Louis Vuitton design in the movie because one of the most iconic scenes is when Regina George basically carries out her vendetta in the school and she wears a belt by Louis Vuitton with the cherry blossoms by Takashi Murakami. She also has the matching pochette and I think she also wears the flats. I rewatched the scene, I can't really tell, but judging from uh, the footage in the movie and also the pictures that are found online, I do think she wears the flats. Regina George actually also carried this bag in another scene where uh, she wears this t-shirt saying something like a little bit dramatic and the miniskirt and then the signature cardigan. So uh, you can see that uh, the placement of the Louis Vuitton products in this movie was very strategic and also contributed to this overall hype. So it was uh, very well done by Louis Vuitton to place these products uh, by Takashi Murakami all over pop culture. It was really an overall fashion trend and it was highly popular. That also means it was highly counterfeited at the time or even until today. This is probably one of the designs where there are the most fakes. And the collaboration with Takashi Murakami lasted for several years, uh, but the monochrome multicolor was discontinued in 2015. I think there were several reasons. One was an overall change in taste. If you think about it, in the 2010s, it was a bit more reduced. It was not so much logos anymore. Phoebe Philo was at Celine. All these more reduced designs were more popular. Maybe also because uh, the bag was so popular, also heavily counterfeited. Uh, people saw it all the time and they got tired of it. So I would just like to remind you, if you want to buy it pre-loved, which may make sense if there's a re-edition of the bag. Uh, be very careful and do your checks. It is sometimes tough to do this online, but there are super fakes. Uh, these are the fakes that are very, very good. I did another video about the super fakes and why I find them highly problematic. And there are also more obvious fakes. And the more obvious fakes you can tell, not only from the shape of the logo, but also the colors, because the original Takashi Murakami design has the 33 different colors. This also relates to uh, Murakami's artistic style. This is one thing. It doesn't mean that if the bag has 33 colors, it is automatically an original. As I said, there are super fakes that do that really well. So please pay attention. This is a highly counterfeited product. So I already said this. A lot of people think about the Monoka Multicolor when they think of this uh, Takashi Murakami and Louis Vuitton collaboration, but it's actually not the only design. I already mentioned another design, the Cherry Blossoms from 2003, which made it into Mean Girls. 
In 2005, he uh, designed the cherries on top of the monogram canvas. So I would say these three are probably the best known designs. There's also one other popular one, the panda from 2004. In 2007, Murakami designed the mocha hands, uh, which was alongside the exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. I think this is a lesser known example. In 2008, he launched the uh, uh, monocamouflage, uh, the camouflage design. I actually really like the name, even though I was not a big fan of the design itself. In 2010, he did the cosmic flower designs. And as I said, in 2015, the monocam multicolor was discontinued. So this was basically 12 years of uh, multiple reissues or reiterations of uh, that monogram canvas and I would say in general it's not only one of the most known Takashi Murakami designs for Louis Vuitton I actually think for Louis Vuitton this is one of the most known monogram canvas interpretations they ever made. So now I said it was discontinued it's highly sought after on the resale market also the other Murakami designs but particularly this uh, monogram multicolor also because uh, current influence and celebrities, for example the Jenners, were seen in uh, pre-loved bags or probably bags they owned from the time. So there was a new hype for all of this. So as I said, it makes sense for Louis Vuitton to rebuild on this hype. And the rumor is that uh, these new bags uh, with this collaboration may launch uh, between January 1st and May 2025. All of this is rumor, so nothing is confirmed yet. And there are also no official press releases yet uh, it's just basically the rumors online but there are many people who say probably it's a reiteration of the monocam multicolor the panda is also on some of these potential products and I also saw a keep all with uh, signature flowers uh, by Takashi Murakami which I think would be a new edition and I'm not sure yet how I feel about this new edition because on the one hand it may be that they just come up with a re-edition of this monochrome multicolor, which is, yeah, I know what they are doing. They want to capture the market that is currently on the resale platform. So they want people to come back and buy the original, I'm sure for a much higher price tag, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. But there may also be new designs. And I have to say, if they only do the first one or focus on that one, I would find it a bit boring. I would even say lazy for me. This is sometimes like doing a second part of a movie that was very successful or turning a successful cartoon into a live action movie. For me, this is not really creativity. But as I said, all of this is rumors. We don't know yet what's going to come. So maybe it's a completely new design by Takashi Murakami for this 2025 edition. So when I filmed this video at the end of November, there was no concrete press release. There were no official pictures. This is the thing with fashion. Uh, there is a lot of talk. So it may be true, it may also not be true. I think it might be true because uh, Louis Vuitton does that very often that they kind of spread these rumors but they release a few pictures and then people start talking. I think it's also a very smart strategy by them to test the market before they actually release the items and uh, maybe they want to see how the market reacts. So as I said, all of this is rumors. We don't know yet, but maybe in this time period between 1st of January and May 2025, there may be a new release of this Takashi Murakami and Louis Vuitton collaboration. And now if you know my videos, you probably already know what's going to come. I can't help it. It's always the art historian in me coming through. I would like to talk about the artist because I do think, yes, everybody knows the brand Louis Vuitton. A lot of people know Marc Jacobs and also his time as the creative director. But uh, I doubt that many people know more about Takashi Murakami. Needless to say, Murakami is not an unknown artist, but I think that most people who bought the bag liked the design. But I'm not sure if they really know a lot about the artist or the background of the designs and I always find this really interesting. And I would like to introduce you to this artist, not because I want to show you I'm an art historian or talk in this typical art lingo that sometimes comes across as very elitist. I actually think that fashion can be a very interesting tool to draw attention to the arts because art or museums can sometimes feel quite 
let's say, scary. A lot of people don't dare to visit museums because they think, oh, I don't know much about the arts. I might feel left out. And uh, to be honest, the art world doesn't make it easy. I also made the experiences where people raise their eyebrows when I said I'm very interested in street art. Oh my God, this is not avant-garde. How can you be an art historian if you like street art? And then I felt really strange. I was like, well, art should be about being open-minded and having different ideas. So this can be very scary, elitist, uh, it is a very small niche, but I think the example of Takashi Murakami, whether you like Louis Vuitton or not, is actually quite good to show uh, how uh, fashion can also help to promote the arts. And don't worry, I'm not going to make this super complicated. What I want to show you is that the artist actually thought about what he was doing. It was not just slapping on a colorful logo. There were thought processes behind this. It's similar to what I said about the Hang Easy Shoe by Manolo Blahnik. So I always find this interesting when you have a product that at first sight looks superficial, it's fashion, but actually there's much more to it. And now you already see, I very often say fashion and art in the same sentence. In a lot of circles, this would be an absolute no-go. Some people say fashion can never be art. A lot of people actually criticize Takashi Murakami for being too commercial, but in my opinion, if an artist is commercial, it doesn't make him a bad artist. And I already see the outcry in the comments, but as I always say, my party, my rules, this is my opinion. I do think that also fashion can be art or that there can also be nice synergy effects between fashion, business and art. Now it's out, I said it, I know it's a deeply philosophical discussion. A lot of people will disagree with me, but still, this is my point of view. And I actually had to think about this when I saw this uh, potential reboot of the Louis Vuitton Takashi Murakami collaboration, because again, it would be something that a lot of people would find a no-go for an artist to collaborate with a fashion house, but I actually think it's a good example to see what is behind the actual designs. And what you will learn is that Takashi Murakami not only thinks a lot when he does these things, you also see his uh, artistic language in there. Also his education is very visible in these designs. So I think this is a very good uh, starting point to analyze also the art of Takashi Murakami himself. Now, who is this Takashi Murakami? Very briefly, he was born in 1962 and he studied Nihonga. This is uh, the traditional Japanese painting at the University of the Arts in Tokyo. He earned a BA, an MFA, a Master in Fine Arts and a PhD. And in 1996, he founded the Hiropon Factory, which is an art production and also artist management uh, company. So you can see on the one hand, he's classically trained as an artist, but obviously he's also very business savvy. And soon Murakami became known for the characters he created. The first one was Mr. D.O.B. I hope I said this correctly. I'm not sure if it's Mr. D.O.B. or Mr. Job. And uh, this is basically considered his alter ego. And it also shows his interest in otaku. And this is the Japanese term for a passion or interest in anime, manga, computers, and also video games. So this is closely reflected in all these characters that he uh, created or creates. And further characters by Murakami are the flowers that you may know, but also bears. And when you look at these characters, at first they look cute, but then Maybe you also get the same feeling as I get. You look at it and it looks a bit creepy. He also said it always comes with this flip side of sadness or violence. So this is one of the things that I would like to discuss in a bit. And as I said, a lot of people criticize him for being commercial. And on the one hand, this is because of what he creates. These characters rooted in anime, manga, video games. But it also relates to the way he sells himself and these characters and the art because he also mass produces toys, keychains, t-shirts. Uh, so you could say he even sells his own merch. So for an artist, uh, this is something that not many people dare to do because it may dilute down their image. A lot of people say you should make art for the sake of the art and not for making money or being too commercial. But this is obviously something that Murakami doesn't care about. And there's also a close link to pop culture. He did the cover uh, of an album for Kanye West. And he also collaborated with the F1 uh, racing driver, Lewis Hamilton 
written for his project 44 plus which i particularly liked so you can see he kind of uh, crosses the boundaries of the arts and also moves into music pop culture all these other things if we take it really far we could say it's similar to what andy warhol did but now i already see the next landslide of comments when people say oh my god how dare you compare andy warhol to takashi murakami but i'm not saying this without any reason because actually a lot of people say that takashi murakami and the super flat art movement that he created are the japanese pop art there is a reason why i brought up uh, this link and where does this super flat movement come from i already said uh, murakami is very good at venturing into other fields and what he also does is curating exhibitions creating dialogues and in the year 2000 he curated the super flat exhibition and this exhibition showcased the flatness in japanese arts and this spanned across time periods so he involved uh, fine arts for example the nihonga japanese traditional painting but also the ukiyo-e the famous japanese woodcuts and then he bridged it to uh, everything after World War II, the anime, the manga that I said before. So you can see this signature two-dimensional style in Japanese art across time. And uh, this exhibition then triggered a movement, a dialogue, which is today known as the super flat movement. And Murakami is one of the most famous representatives. And this is actually what I said before. A lot of people refer to this Japanese super flat movement as the Japanese pop art. Some even call it surrealism. I'm not sure if I would agree to that. I would be curious what you think about this. Let me know in the comments below. So we already see it gets really difficult to pinpoint Murakami to only one medium to one time period to one artistic style because he loves to move around and for example another source of inspiration for him is also natural disasters maybe you remember the earthquake and the subsequent tsunami in 2011 which has become a big source of inspiration for him also and in general we could say that he's very versatile this work across the media the time periods but also very forward looking he does things when they are not a standard yet and he is also heavily involved in nfts in the arts for example these are non-fungible tokens so this is this whole movement around blockchain technology in the arts so he also works in that field if you want to learn more about nfts in the arts or in fashion let me know in the comments below then i can do a separate video on this topic and in the case of murakami again it shows that he's not scared to experiment with new technology new movements in the arts and one important thing that i would like to show you is the link to traditional art i've talked a lot now about the pop culture element but let's take a step back and i show you why his education in uh, nihonga art is also very visible so nihonga art as i said before is the traditional japanese painting and there's a concept relating to beautiful scenery beautiful nature and this concept concept is called, I hope I say it correctly, Setsugetsu Ka or Setsugeka. And this means that uh, it is a depiction of a beautiful landscape or scenery. And you may remember if you have seen my video about Karl Lagerfeld, he was inspired uh, by the Japanese and Chinese lacquer uh, furniture. And there it is similar. You very often have these beautiful landscapes. Uh, the beautiful scenery and at first you may say yeah it's like in the european style of painting it's a landscape painting it's beautiful but that's it but what is very important is that in chinese and in japanese art you need to look closer because there are many details that may have a meaning for example a certain flower may indicate this is a character trait uh, of a person or a wish that we have for the person we give this painting to or the artwork to or a certain bird might stand for something or symbolize something. So we can't just dismiss it and say it's only a beautiful landscape painting. And I would like to use two examples here to illustrate this a bit better. For example, the crane in Japanese traditional art stands for longevity and the cherry blossom stands for the fleeting nature of life. Does this remind you something? I said Murakami also put the cherry blossoms on the Louis Vuitton bags and I don't think it's a coincidence. You may now say I'm materialistic, I'm glorifying consumerism, but I do think given his background, given his education and what he does for Japanese art in general, 
I think he knew what he was doing and it was intentional to again show us this cartoonish cherry blossom actually stands for the fleeting nature of life and happiness. And when discussing Japanese art, uh, it is difficult to do that without mentioning Chinese art because there were a lot of synergies between the two. And actually this concept in Nihonga art goes back to the Chinese poet Bai Tsui. And this poet lived in the Tang dynasty in the late 8th and early 9th century. And this style then became very popular in the Edo period in Japan, which was in the 17th until the 19th century. Now we have the background of the traditional art. And this is something that we take and use when looking at Murakami's art. So let's look at his flowers. So again, we look at them and they look beautiful, funny, cute, happy. Some people say... Uh, they uh, came up because he was inspired by the floral designs in his home when he grew up in Japan. And the first time he used the flowers was in 1996 in his work Cosmos. So now you have this like cute looking flower, but actually it stands for much more. Uh, very often when you look closely, you actually get a different feeling and you will see that in Murakami's case, happiness very often goes hand in hand with sadness. And maybe this is exactly what Murakami wants to tell us. There is no happiness without sadness. But with Murakami, there's always more if you pay close attention. And he himself actually said that uh, these flowers symbolize that happiness is fleeting. And he even said that sometimes he also needs to always keep smiling. He never stops smiling on the outside because if he did, he would be defeated. And this is actually a reference to Japanese culture where people very often smile on the outside but they don't uh, show what's on the inside. And I actually think this is nothing that's only valid in Japan. Very often uh, in any country we are in situations where on the outside we need to show that we are happy and we smile even though on the inside we may be crumbling or we may be very sad. And I just said pay close attention. In some of his artworks, especially after 2010, very often you can find one flower or a few flowers that are not smiling. Sometimes they are crying, you can see the tears or they just have a sad or sleepy expression. So this is also something where amongst all the happiness, the sadness is hiding. So many articles and experts say that these uh, concealed weeping flowers, the sad flowers, may stand for the trauma of the Japanese people, especially after losing in World War II. But I actually think it may also be a link to more recent events. I mentioned the natural disasters before. Maybe Murakami also wants to link to Japan after uh, 2011, after the earthquake and the nuclear disaster. And over time, from this first use of the flowers until today, you can see that they become more and more cartoonish. Also, the uh, colors become brighter and brighter, and it's actually kind of a signature. You don't uh, need to see the flowers. Also, from the color scheme, we could say we can tell that this is Murakami. And this is also something that I said before. It was reflected in the uh, monochrome multicolor, these uh, bright rainbow colors of Murakami and the rainbow is something I would take up here. I said before he focuses on the happiness but also on the sadness. Sometimes it's not only the weeping flowers it's also he incorporates skulls for example to show something even more dramatic and I think this may show that there's no happiness without sadness but I do think that uh, overall his art is quite positive because the happiness is this rainbow. Maybe this is the hope that after all the sadness we can be happy and exactly these colors and the cartoonish style is also something that a lot of foreigners know about Japan uh, in Japan it is very popular to dress up to wear costumes and in a way it may be considered uh, a way to break out of the gray daily life which is very structured with a lot of rules and hierarchies and by wearing a colorful cartoonish costume you can basically break out into happiness and I would like to give him credit for something I don't think that the average shopper at Louis Vuitton, anybody on the street who is uh, interested in fashion or the arts, would necessarily have a strong interest for traditional Japanese arts. Unless you have a special connection to it or a link to the country, I think this is a kind of a niche thing. But with his 
cartoonish approach, the commercial approach. He draws attention to the topic and in general he draws attention to the arts uh, and I would even say he uh, contributed to democratizing art. And what do I mean with this? I just mean making art more accessible to more people. Very often people are scared of entering museums or they are simply not interested because they don't have the right hook, I would say. Nothing causes uh, the interest in entering a museum. And I think museums have to draw attention to the culture, to the art, whatever they are doing, but they are limited in what they can do. But if an artist like Murakami then also collaborates with a brand, and commercializes the art, yes, it may be frowned upon, but I do think a lot of people pass by a shop window by Louis Vuitton, look into the window and then say, interesting, this is an artist that I have not seen before. What is behind this? Maybe I want to learn more. Maybe this is my idealistic view and I know this does not apply to any person who queues up at Louis Vuitton to buy this bag. Probably the majority has no interest in the art behind, but there may be a few who are interested and maybe they are then encouraged to uh, read more about the artist, learn more and also visit museums. So if we can take this, this is a very small thing that's very positive. Yes, it is commercialized, but it also has a positive effect on the arts. And another thing for which he deserves credit is drawing attention to Japanese art, not only contemporary art, but also across time periods, across media and movements. And also he actively bridges the gap between art, business, fashion, pop culture, whether you like it or not, this is an interesting experiment. And now I'm very curious to hear from you. Did you know about Takashi Murakami and what do you think about this particular artist collaboration with Louis Vuitton? Or what do you think about their collaborations with artists in general? And what do you think about the rumors? Would you buy one of these reissues if they are really launched in 2025? Or are you over this Takashi Murakami uh, collaboration? Let me know in the comments below. And yes, self-promotion, but I would like to ask you if you like this video to show it by liking it and also by subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. If you want to read more about fashion, you can head over to my website thepinklookbook.com and you can also check out my fashion label Pelagona. And if you enjoyed this video about Louis Vuitton, I have another video about Louis Vuitton where I explain all the different bag materials that they use. Just as a spoiler alert, the monogram canvas that I also discussed here is actually not not made from leather. You can learn more about this in my video. Thank you very much for watching this video and see you in the next one.